Today we're going to talk about early quantum models. Actually, we're going to talk about models for atoms and end with the quantum model. So, starting with the atom. The earliest model of the atom comes from uh, Democritus. And Democritus said, I think I mentioned this before, if I take something like this card, I could tear it in half and have two cards. And I could take one of that and tear it in half and have two smaller ones. And I could keep going. And he theorized that at some point, I would get to a place where it was no longer divisible. And so he said, this indivisible thing must be the fundamental substance that matter is made of. And he called it an atom, which means indivisible. And so that's the, the earliest model of the atom. Just it's whatever you get when you break things down to their smallest indivisible pieces. And of course, I believe it was Aristotle believed in the, uh, the four elements on earth, earth, water, air, and fire, plus a quintessence, the stuff that heavenly bodies were made out of. And so, you know, it was a simple world back then. And they just thought all of the different things we had were made out of different combinations of these four things. Now, it seems kind of simplistic, and yet think about our DNA. What's our DNA made out of? We have four pairs, right? Uh, well, four nucleotides. Yeah. They're what? Nucleotide base pairs. Okay. Yes. You know what I'm not? Biologist or biochemist. Don't laugh at me, Jerry. Okay. So that's our earliest model there. And you could have made a lot of combinations, just like we can make all kinds of crazy DNA out of just a very simple base set. But it was soon learned that there was more to it. And so um, I believe it was J.J. Thompson in the late 19th century did an experiment where he had a cathode, which I never understand how the nomenclature goes. The negative side of a battery is connected here, and they call it the cathode. And this thing's called a cathode ray tube because what they saw was there's some kind of beam going through here. They saw a light at the end and they could see a, a band going through there. And so people, of course, you're a scientist. You see something interesting, what do you do? You study it, yeah. You don't say, huh, I wonder what that is. Oh, well, we'll never know. Scientists are going to study it to try to find out. And so they started studying it. And so Thompson did things like, let's put it in a magnetic field. What would happen if it was in a magnetic field if it was not charged? There's no charge that's in a magnetic field, it will. It'll do nothing. Because the magnetic force will only apply to something that is charged and moving or has a magnetic moment. Also put it in electric field, and he saw that both electric fields and magnetic fields created forces, making it deviate from a straight line. And so by adjusting the strength of crossed electric fields and magnetic fields, they could determine that these particles had a negative charge and um, I believe got a charge to mass ratio, the ratio of the mass of the charge to the size of the charge. And after a little more study, they determined that these things were electrons. So that what they initially called a cathode ray, because it was whatever kind of radiation was coming out of the cathode, they started to call electrons because they realized they're the same thing that we were dealing with when we had Ben Franklin rubbing his rod with, you know, a sheepskin or whatever. So then we come back to the atomic model. What are you going to do for the atomic model? If you have electrons in matter, well, Thompson came up with a model. He called it the plum pudding model. That is, he said that matter is like this slurry of positive charge, but in it you have these little points of negative charge that are the electrons. So the plum pudding model, yeah, J.J. Thompson, at least I have the name right. The plum pudding model, yes, and he found the charge over mass ratio. <laughs> Um, it, it was Millikan who did the experiment to actually find what the values of the charges are. Um, Millikan's experiment, we did it in physics lab when I was in college. It was such a tedious experiment. It took us two days to do that physics lab. 
And then some genius we'll call Richard Webb used a computer to make it easier to take data and they were able to do it in one day. And so when my sister took general physics, the, uh, the teacher we very proudly, and Vicky's brother wrote this software so we can do it in one day. And you know what all the students did? Hot tip, they did not cheer my name. <laughs> but it, it was, um, what you have to do is you have to look through this little microscope and track little, little spheres. Um, we use neoprene spheres, I think it was, or something like that, some kind of rubber spheres. And you track their motion when you change the voltage between plates. And by measuring the speed that they're moving and knowing the viscosity of the fluid, you can determine the charge on them. And then you make a graph of the different charges and the separations then tell you how much each individual charge each electron is. And it's, it's pretty tedious. But that's what Millikan did with his oil droplet. He used oil droplets rather than you know, some kind of rubber droplets. There's a picture of the experiment. You basically can't see after three hours of doing this, right? You're sitting there trying to strain with that eye. The accommodation thing, it gives out. First question, if you listen to the story, what is the more common name for the cathode ray? And so we'll, we'll get to the picture of the plum pudding model after this, I'm pretty sure. Oh my. Oh my. Okay, everyone's answered. Well, it got better toward the end. At one point, we had two people who said positron. Anybody know what a positron is? Yeah, it's the antimatter of an electron. It did not come out of my mouth today until I saw somebody put that in. And, okay, 17 people said an electron. That was correct. The cathode rays, the things that were coming out of the cathode, were determined to be just electrons. And basic properties of the electron, we've already seen the electron has this charge, and I think we've seen the mass as well. The electron is very important in physics, especially when you get to what's going on in chemistry, the nuclear material. And here's my picture of the plum pudding model. I knew I would get there. The pink stuff is just a nebulous positive charge. The negatives are electrons. The reason that we call it a plum pudding model, or I like to call it the oatmeal with raisin model, because you know what, I don't eat plum pudding. Um, plum pudding is a, a pudding that has raisins in it. So oatmeal is something that's pretty similar, especially if it's been overcooked, it's really mushy. Um, and so that's basically what he said atoms were like. And everybody said, sure, that makes sense. I'm good with that. Yay for Thompson. Well, then we get to the work done by the research group of Rutherford, Ernst Rutherford. And so in Rutherford's group, he had working under him Hans Geiger. You guys familiar with that name, Geiger? Yeah, he's famous for the Geiger part of the Geiger-Muller counter. I don't know what happened to Mueller and why no one ever says his name, but... Um, Right, because when you say Geiger counter, it's you're just dropping Mueller off. That's that's the instrument, all right. Um, so we had Hans Geiger, I'm pretty sure it's Hans, working with him, and then they had Marsden. Marsden was the newbie in the lab. He was like the guy who just graduated from college, and you can tell how important he is in my mind because I forgot his first name. And so Geiger comes to the boss, Rutherford, says, you know, I think young Mars in here is ready to do an experiment on his own. We're ready to you know, test his wings and fly. And so Rutherford says, well, you know, here's something interesting to do. Let's have him take a piece of gold, hit it with a mallet, because it's malleable, and flatten it out. You can make gold as small as 10 atomic layers thick. You can make it very thin just by smashing it. And so let's make a really thin film of gold and then we'll shoot alpha particles at it. What's an alpha particle? 
Well, according to Jordan, Jordan, that's what you have in today's uh, reading quiz or the uh, the concept coach questions, right? Mm -hmm. So, what's an alpha particle? Uh, it's a helium nucleus. What they knew at that point was that if you have radioactive materials, radioactive means there's some kind of radiation coming out of it, and they had early on identified common types of radiation by how penetrating they are. Least penetrating, alpha. You can stop an alpha particle with a piece of paper. Or if I had a test question in my other class this year, sunscreen is good enough to protect you from alpha particles. They're really not dangerous. Unless, of course, they get through to you and then they can give you skin cancer or if you breathe something in and it decays, then it will be absorbed by your lungs and cause things like lung cancer. So we have alpha particles. They did careful study, just like with the cathode rays, they determined that alpha particles had a mass that was the same as helium and had a charge of plus two, which we now know was a helium nucleus. Back then, they didn't know. And then they had beta particles, which they quickly determined are the same as electrons, and then the gamma particles, which were photons. So he was studying nuclear physics. He was studying alpha particles. I mean, so, well, let's use alpha particles to test the plum pudding model. Because in science, you come up with a hypothesis, and the hypothesis was that your, slur your, your atoms were basically just positive charge spread everywhere with a few electrons in them. The model was the plum pudding, but that was the hypothesis. Now you got to test it. And so he said, if we put this thin film of gold, and it has just a little electron here, an electron here, an electron here, and then I shoot my big old alpha particle. The alpha particle will probably go through with just a slight amount of modulation because it had to go through, you know, the the, the slurry of positive charge. You know, it had to splash through, if you will. And if it comes really, really close to the electron, it might be deviated just a small amount. And if it hits the electron, well, that electron's so insignificant in mass, it'll just be, you know, make it slow down a little more, but not to any significant amount. Well, they did the experiments, and that was not what Marsden reported when he did the experiment. Marsden comes back and he says, most of my alpha particles went through and they did not slow down at all. They just went through with no change. Like they didn't hit anything. Some of them deviated by small angles, but there were a large number that deviated by crazy angles. Some bounced straight back at me. Now, if you, you know, well, this is how Rutherford explained it when he went on the, the circuit. You know, this is what I found. He said, imagine that you take some toilet paper. Well, he's a tissue paper back then, you know. I think this was toilet paper. Um, imagine you take some tissue paper and you shoot a cannonball at it and the cannonball bounces straight back at you off of the tissue paper. That's how shocked he was in the outcome. Not what he expected. So as a scientist, did the experiment, did it follow the predictions made by the hypothesis? No, so what do you do then in the scientific method? You gotta go back and make a new hypothesis because you have new information that destroyed the old one. And so that's what he did. So now I'm going to go through probably five slides on what I've just talked about. Picture of the experiment. Um, okay. With his experimentation, Rutherford was at, I mean, the guy was no slouch. They quickly were able to determine by measuring how much energy it took for the type of scattering to change. He could determine when he was actually hitting the positive thing, the, the things that were bouncing off of. And so he actually determined the size of the nucleus at that point. And there was a small positively charged nucleus with a lot of mass. So his experiment showed that you had a small positive nucleus with electron charge out here around it. And so he came up with a new model that he called the planetary model. Now, even though at that time we knew that planets weren't doing circular orbits, his planetary model said that the electrons are doing circular orbits around a heavy nucleus like the planets are doing circular orbits around the sun. 
And so that was our next significant step in the models, the planetary model. And it's kind of funny because when I was in high school and I was introduced to this, I had a really hard time distinguishing that model from the next ones coming up. That's nowhere close to what we believe now, but somehow it resonated and I had a hard time separating it. So now a clicker question based on this. What did Rutherford expect would happen when Mars and fired alpha particles in a thin gold foil? Okay, I swear you're just trying to make me feel sad about myself. <laughs> if that's the goal, it's working. <laughs> okay, turn to your friends and discuss what I just mentioned here about what Rutherford expected. Okay, let's do it again. I'm praying for you. <laughs> Okay, this time we had a little change. Okay, Paris. Okay, Paris said C and give us your reasoning. Okay. Now, I would have I would have chosen B instead of C, but they're both in the ballpark, you know, very small amount to unaffected. Going back to my picture, my explanation, you essentially if you splash through that positive stuff, you'd lose just a little from, you know, splashing through it. So you'd have a very very small change, but virtually none. And so that virtually none is why unaffected is a reasonable answer there. What he found was, which one A or D did he find? Good. A, except for it wasn't most, some. Some alphas would bounce at, bounce at random angles. Most of them went through completely unaffected. This is what most of them did. Most of them were completely unaffected, but some of them did this. So actually, now that I've done the, so green will be what really happens. And what he actually expected was be there, that most would, or yeah, most would just slow a very, very small amount. So Maul's completely broken. He comes up with this planetary model. Like I said, he determined the size of the nucleus, about 10 to the minus 15th meters. Now just think about 10 to the minus 15th meters. Here's a meter. Divide it into tenths, and you have a decimeter. Divide it into tenths again, you have a centimeter. Divide it into tenths again, you have a millimeter, and those are small. But that's only 10 to the minus 3. That's 10 to the minus 15. The nucleus is incredibly tiny. And the size of the atom around 10 to the minus 10 meters 
or 100,000 times bigger than the nucleus. What else do you have in the atom besides the nucleus? <laughs> Mostly empty space, but the particles that you do have? Electrons. So you have the electrons out there filling that region. Now, what we know about electrons today is that electrons are enormously small. They may be points. They may have some finite size, but they're really, really tiny, much, much smaller than the nucleus. So that's where we get Jonathan's answer. It's mostly empty space with electrons flying around. Well, there are things that showed that Rutherford was wrong. It was, what, something like, 1910 or so when Rutherford did his experiment. I don't have the date here. And within a couple years, Niels Bohr came over and worked with him, and they realized there's significant problems. We've got to have something different going on. This can't be correct. So what are significant problems? You guys, when we wore the cool little glasses and we looked at the the tube, the gas tube, and you saw specific lines instead of continuous range of colors, that indicated that only certain energies of photons are coming out of that gas. Well, with the, the planetary model, the electrons could have any old energy. And they're going in circles. If a charged particle go, goes in a circle, it's accelerating. And we learn when we talk about x-rays, that if you have an accelerating charged particle, it has to give off radiation. And thus it's going to lose energy because that's energy that's leaving. And so what you should have if the Rutherford model was correct, the electrons go, and within a nanosecond they collapse into the nucleus. <laughs> and thus there's no chemistry. Now I know school would be easier if there was no chemistry, but then again there would be none of us here to go to school anyway. So there's clear signs that there's something wrong. Looking at that spectrum indicates you only have certain energies available for the light coming out, which indicates that there must be something that's only certain energies in the atom itself. And so Bohr, so here's pictures of those line spectra. So Bohr said, I'm just going to come up with a quantum hypothesis. I'm going to hypothesize that the electrons in the atom have only certain steady state energies. I think I have these written down somewhere. Um, oh man, this is, I got to go through all these equations before I get to Bohr's model. It really is important. I just want to jump to the, the chase, but looking at these spectra, it was noticed that you have a very unique fingerprint type spectrum, different gas, different spectrum, different ionization state, different spectrum. And so it was Balmer, I think it's Johann Balmer, who was a school teacher who saw a pattern. And so Balmer said that one over the wavelength for these lines here, if you look at hydrogen gas, which I don't think any of these are hydrogen gas. Actually, no, the top one is. If you look at hydrogen gas, you see that one over the wavelengths are equal to a constant that's called the Rydberg constant multiplied by 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over n squared, where n is any integer bigger than 2. So n could be 3, 4, 5, 6. And so if you put in those different n's, you get different solutions for the wavelengths, and they exactly match the wavelengths we observe. So that's called the Lyman series. But then science advanced, and we started being able to measure things that are in the, the infrared and ultraviolet ranges. And that, I have been saying Balmer, haven't I? Okay. So then Lyman, Lyman comes in and he says, you know, the UV spectrum can be explained by 1 over wavelength is equal to the Rydberg constant times 1 over 1 squared minus 1 over n squared, where n is equal to 2, et cetera. Any integer that's 2 or bigger. Now I look at that and I say, you know, I probably could have come up with that equation on my own. If I had Balmer's work to start with, that kind of makes sense, right? You just change the 2 squared to a 1 squared. But it doesn't stop there. We have in the infrared, we have bracket.
who said, you know, in the infrared, we can use this pattern. <laughs> Bracket, um, Poshin said, hey, we could use one over four squared. Fund, hey, we could use one over five squared. These guys are pretty, pretty genius and, you know, original, right? And so we have all of these sequences that will explain the different visible lines we see in the hydrogen. Well, visible was Balmer. Ultraviolet is Lyman and all the rest are infrared. And so what's going on there, that leads us to, so here's the Lyman, the Poshin, et cetera. Here's what the spectrum actually looks like. So you have the Poshin series produces things that are all ultraviolet. Oops, wrong side. Those are infrared. The Lyman series is ultraviolet. The Balmer is mostly visible. Poshin and beyond is infrared. Please, please, next slide B. Good. The Bohr model. So Bohr said, let's start by saying that the electrons are making circular orbits. So he stays with the circular orbits. But they have stationary orbits. That means that the energy is fixed. This rule basically says what we understand about the radiation that has to occur if something's accelerating won't apply here. Now, to me, I'm really uncomfortable with that. If we have a law, we have a law. But he said, I'm just going to posit that you have these stationary states so they can't continuously lose energy. They have to maintain their energy as they're doing these orbits. And so his model just has an electron orbiting the nucleus with the force between them being what we've learned before, force equal to K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. That's What is Q1? Is the charge of the nucleus. What is Z in that equation? Z is the atomic number. It's the number of protons in the nucleus. And so the charge of the nucleus is the number of protons multiplied by the charge of an electron because protons just have a positive charge. The second E... is the charge of the electron. And then of course, R squared, the separation. So that's the force acting. Now, he said that we have discrete energies, steady state energies, and that the photons that are emitted or absorbed only occur if you have the energy difference between two stationary states. So an electron could absorb an energy exactly equal to the gap between two states and, and absorb the light. If the light is some other energy, if a photon has just a little too much or just a little too little, it can't be absorbed. And likewise, you can have an electron's energy fall from one state to another and give off light with energy equal to the gap. So what he's saying is the energy of the photons, HF, is equal to the difference in the energy states, in those stationary states. So we could go back to the work that we already had, the, the Balmer series and so on, and we could take from one over the wavelength, and we know that energy is hc over lambda. So that should be equal to hc times one over lambda is the Rydberg constant times one over for the, let's say for the Balmer series, two squared minus one over N squared. And so that should give us the energies of the photons. But then we can take this and say, if that's equal to energy final minus energy initial, then that must mean that energy final is equal to hc r over 2 squared and energy initial is hc r over n squared right so that's just a, a direct outcome 
of Balmer's st statements about steady state energies and the, and the electrons can only jump from one possible state to another possible state. But then he added his quantum hypothesis that the angular momentum of an electron in, a, in an atom is quantized. It can only have certain values. And those certain values were n h bar. Remember, we introduced h bar yes, yesterday, last class period, when we were doing the uncertainty relation. So h bar is just equal to Planck's constant over 2 pi. And that's the unit of angular momentum according to the Bohr model. Now, I have to emphasize the Bohr model is not our final model. This is not what we believe is happening in the atom, but we're setting up how we got to where we are because these ideas, each model is moving closer to correct. And so he said, okay, we have only these certain angular momenta available. And if you only have certain angular momenta, since angular momentum, if you're going in a circle, that's going to be speed times radius. You only have certain combinations of speed times radius present. Or you could even say that the kinetic energy is equal to one half L squared. Um, well, it's I omega squared or L squared over I, I believe it is, right? I omega squared. Uh, yeah. And since I is MR squared in this case. Get rid of that one. And so kinetic energy is just L squared over 2MR, which should be N H bar quantity squared over 2MR squared. So you only have certain kinetic energies available to you. And then it just comes down to doing simple math. We have this relationship, the relationship for any momentum, and we can go back and we can use if something's going in a circle, then we have to have the sum of the forces toward the center. According to Newton's second law, what's the sum of the forces toward the center? Mass times acceleration toward the center. But if something's going in a circle, that acceleration toward the center is V squared over R. And so we have an equation here that says KZE squared over R squared is equal to m v squared over r. And so that gives us an equation that will relate velocity and radius. And then looking at this relationship right here, m v n squared r n squared equals n h bar gives us another, re oh, there's no squares here. Let's think about the line gives us another relationship between V and N, or V and R. So we have two relationships between V and R. We can solve those two relationships and find exactly what the allowed energies are, what the allowed radii are, what the allowed speeds are, what the allowed angular momenta are. And so in doing that calculation, Bohr determined that the allowed radii, and you could just follow through the math, or I didn't do it simply to save us some time, that the allowed radii are this equation. We usually take whoops, I should have put the Z there. We usually take that and say that's a constant that we'll call the Bohr radius. And that Bohr radius calculates out to 52.92 picometers. And then the, radi the radii that an electron can have orbiting the nucleus is n squared over z times that Bohr radius. Now I have to once again emphasize this isn't correct. This is Bohr's model. How many people have used the Bohr radius in a class like chemistry? Only two. Okay, three. The Bohr radius we use a lot. And the reason we use it a lot is because even though this isn't correct, this isn't what we believe to be correct now, this is the most likely radius, the most likely distance from the nucleus to an electron in a hydrogen atom. 
And so with the Bohr model now, we have specific energy levels that turn out to be, and we just, for our equation, we put the energy sub N is equal to energy sub zero over N squared, where energy sub zero is equal to minus 13.6 electron volts. This is for a hydrogen atom. Um, if it's not hydrogen, you have a Z squared here. So now it's for all atoms. So the spectrum of energies available to a hydrogen atom, according to the Bohr model, are shown here. And each one of those arrows shows a possible transition. The electron could go from state N equals 3 to N equals 1, or N equals 4 to N equals 2, or whatever. So the Bohr model says those tell us the different colors that we should be able to see when we look at a gas tube that is giving off light. And so this range right here, the Balmer series, that should be the range that we see in the visible spectrum. The visible spectrum is basically this here. And so we have energies that are between, if you go from three to two, how many electron volts is that? If it's going from three to two, it's going from what value to what value for the energy? Minus 1.5 to minus 3.5. So the electron has dropped in energy, right? Which means that it's releasing energy equal to the difference. So minus 1.5 minus minus 3.5 is going to be 1.9 electron volts. And so you should have, for your highest energy photons, 1.9 electron volts. Your lowest energy photons would be going from zero to minus three point. I said that backward. That's your lowest energy. Your highest energy would be going from zero to minus 3.4. So it'd be 3.4 electron volts. So that's the range that you're going to have in the Balmer series. Now, this looks great. Like I said, you know, the planetary model resonated with me when I was in high school. This model here, the Bohr model, is very similar, but it set a quantum condition set this, there's only allowed stationary energy states with quantized momenta, and now it gives us specific energies available. But it turns out that it also has really significant flaws. For instance, it says that the, um, the brightness of the lines should basically just relate to, you know, the... <laughs> If you're going from three to two, it's probably more likely than four to two because there's going to be more in three than there are in four. And so you should just have simple, you know, sequences of how the brightness varies. That's not what happens in real life. And you have some that don't even occur. And so, like, people knew right away, okay, Bohr's model is better, but it's not right. And so then what do you do? You've got to come up with a better model, one that explains. Um, here's another thing that occurs. When you put the atom in a magnetic field, you'll have these lines that we saw. Uh, yeah, not there. These lines that we saw will split. Now, this one here is already two lines. But if you put this in a strong magnetic field, you're going to have the lines will split. We call that the Zeeman effect. And there's no way to explain that with the Bohr model. And so the next step after that was the quantum model. And so the quantum model, <laughs> I'm going to get to where we are, says that we have something different going on. Now, the correspondence principle, we've already talked about that. What we learn in quantum physics has to apply elsewhere. Um, it has to agree if we get to classical physics is what that's saying. De Broglie had produced the idea that particles could be waves. And surprisingly, if you take that idea and you say, well, let us suppose that then our electrons, instead of doing circular orbits like Bohr said, are like strings that are circles that are resonating. And it turns out that if you treat the electrons as if they're, they're doing vibrations on a circle, your resonance condition for vibrations on a circle would be you have to have an integer number of wavelengths for the circumference. 
And that condition exactly replicates Bohr's quantum hypothesis. So treating the electrons as if they're doing circles and then having um, fluctuations, waves on them like a wave on a string, exactly replicates the Bohr model. There is no difference. So de Broglie's hypothesis about the electron having a wavelength that's Planck's constant over its momentum exactly matches the work done by Bohr, which, which is kind of surprising. Um, what's more surprising is I know that I prepared a lot more slides. <laughs> I had pretty pictures. Let me try. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I know I prepared more slides. I'm going to actually, the, the lecture that I had for last time is where I was going to pretty much continue. So I'm going to just go there and <laughs> go to where we ended up. Um, it's kind of embarrassing. I don't know what happened. Because the next step in the process, by the way, this slide, I think I had at the beginning, I didn't mention it. For the homework, I think I put an equation that had the uncertainty relationship between energy and time. There is an uncertainty relationship that, with energy and time that looks exactly like the uncertainty relationship between momentum and position. It turns out the derivation is actually more complicated with the energy time one, but it comes out to be the same result. So in particle physics, you might wonder how over there at CERN, they smash things together and they're finding particles like the um, the Higgs boson. And they're determining an energy or rest mass of the Higgs boson. How do they do that? They actually do it by using this uncertainty relationship that I circled. What they're measuring is, is a resonance and they measure the, um, the half width for the energy and they can determine the time. It's, it's really complicated and really, really hypothetical. They're not finding a particle, isolating that particle and looking at it and doing experiments on the particle because they're too transitory. They might be around for 10 to the minus 21 seconds or so. You can't do an experiment in 10 to the minus 21 seconds. But what they're looking at is they see these energy bursts and the measure that half width of that energy burst in the center of it. And they use this relationship to infer a lifetime based on the half width of the energy. And they use the center point of the energy to, of course, get the energy. Okay. So you can see we're back basically to where we were. A confined particle has quantized energies is what we learn with quantum physics. Now I'm going to start with what we call the particle in a box. And people in physics 252, they'll learn all about it in class tomorrow. People in physics 152, if you want to learn about the particle in a box, come to class tomorrow and we will cover that completely. But what is the particle in a box? First, we learned that the electric field was our wave function for a photon. The word photon means the particle of light. The electric field was the wave function. And the probability of finding the wave function was the intensity, or of finding the photon, And so what we have is the intensity is proportional to the electric field squared, which sets a relationship saying, if we take our wave function and square it, that will tell us about the probability of finding our particle. And so for a particle like an electron, instead of talking about electric field, we use the Greek letter psi for our wave function. So the Greek letter psi is analogous to the electric field for light. And then the probability of finding the particle, if it's an electron, the probability of finding the electron in some region is found by squaring psi. And in fact,
Sai, how would you say what I just wrote? What would you say the left part is? Absolute value of psi squared. Now that is exactly what it means, but we in math say it differently. That's saying psi star psi. Psi star is the complex conjugate. Psi, this wave function, doesn't have to be a real number. It can be a complex number, something that has a real part and an imaginary part. And in that case, when you do the absolute value, you have to take the original thing, multiply it by its complex conjugate. That's what the star means. You just change the signs of all the i's to minus i's. And then you multiply those two together. You square root, and that gives you absolute value. Of course, the square... We just call it psi mod squared then. And so absolute value squared is correct, but the actual calculation is a little different because it's complex. So that's the probability density. That is the probability per unit length or per unit area, or per, you know, depends on your dimensionality, of finding the particle. So the actual probability of a particle being between x and x plus dx, where dx is a small, small amount of space, is psi mod squared of x dx. So it's the psi mod squared times the little region, the width, that you're checking to see if it exists in there. That little region part is actually important because, of course, if you are looking at no width at all, what's the probability of finding a particle in a region of no width? Zero, right? <laughs> so you, that, that dx actually is really important. Um, and it makes a lot more sense if you get into the calculus part, which is why we're going to cover it carefully in class tomorrow. So for the particle in the box calculation, we say let's make a box. And the particle is in here. It doesn't have enough energy to get out of the box. And then we ask a simple question. So the particle's in the box. Where's the particle in the box? In classical physics, what would your answer be? I put a particle in the box. So I put the box in the back room. <laughs> well, here's a box. I take a box and I put a ping pong ball in the box. Okay. My ping pong balls were all in the box. I put this in the box. Where is it? Okay, on the bottom is correct. <laughs> That's good. That's not what I meant. Where is it left to right? Well, assuming it's flat, so the same potential energy everywhere. Classical physics says it could be anywhere. It could be here, 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 right? That's what classical physics says. That's not what quantum physics says, though. Quantum physics says that you are going to set up standing waves just like you would a string and so your wave function you have different wave functions just like you can have different wave functions for a string that is you can have a string resonating at its resonant frequency or at its you know second harmonic third harmonic and so on and that's what quantum physics says now if i take these and that's the wave function how do i find the probability What, what did we say on the previous slide? You take the psi mod squared. And so if I take the first one and I square it, I'm going to have something that goes like that. If I take the second one and I square it, it goes like that. What this says is if you're in this lowest state, it's most likely to be in the center. And the chances of it being outside of that drop off as you move away. But if you're in the second state, where is it most likely to be? If you're in the two state, where is it most likely to be found? Either here or here. And it cannot exist in the center. 
cannot exist in the center doesn't match what we understand for classical physics. So we will pick up with the atom and how